Hello magpies and welcome to my first ever dedicated storytelling video. Today I wanted to share with you a particularly difficult and problematic story with a fairly narcissistic objective in mind. You see, I believe that, and I believe I am true in, but I am correct in believing that if the extraordinary unlikely bordering on impossible circumstance comes to pass that this channel ends up being relatively successful, then people are going to be digging through my older uploads looking for some problematic or wrong thing I said to attack me over. Come on, don't deny it. We all know it's true, as do I. So, as I care very deeply about helping you to achieve the outcomes you desire, to learn the things that you want to learn, I'm going to make it easy with you and lead with this story of the worst thing I have ever done. The name of this story is Back to Japan. And I don't have a script, I'm not reading off anything, I'm just mostly speaking off the cuff, so this could be disastrous, but let's, let's dive right into it. Let's swoop on in. So... So the necessary background for this story is that this happened probably, oh, I would say 15 years ago, roundabout. I was a pretty young man. I was walking home from a friend's house. It was about 2 a.m., sometime between 1 and 2 a.m., and I was high as a kite. I mean, we're talking golden, toasted golden brown on both sides. We're talking... My feet weren't even touching the ground, I'm pretty sure. Now this is all relevant to the story, so let me set the scene. I was walking up a side street that had just diverged off the main road. The main road continued downhill at an incline, gradually turning to the left. While this side street, running adjacent to the main road for a while, continued uphill before turning to the right. I was walking along the footpath, and to my left was the road, and on the other side of the road, a small wooden barricade, about knee-high, and on the other side of that, a two to three meter drop down to the main road. To my right-hand side, I was walking beside a school, and this school was flanked by a row of tall trees, and ahead of me, the road curved to the right, and the positioning of the trees was such that I could not see what was around the corner. I could not see what was coming. So, just as I'm walking up the street there, a car comes tearing down the road, and somebody sticks their head out the window, and they yell... I'm like... What the, f what the fuck? Do, do, do I look Japanese? Spoiler alert, I do not. So just I'm trying to process what the hell just happened. I see him. He steps out into view, walking the opposite way down the footpath, coming into view around the trees. He is a young, about my age, very scared looking Asian man. And I realize they were yelling at him not me. Now, as an aside here, I don't know, friends, what your personal experience is with the Hawaki tabaki, if any, but I find that while it is a uh, very... Um, it can be an experience enhancer in certain situations, like watching a movie, or playing a video game, or reading a book, or cooking some food. Things that allow you to tunnel vision in and focus on one thing at a time. But in this circumstance, I was not in moderation here. I was soaring like Icarus, and I was out in the wild, woolly world where things jump out at me unexpectedly. And in situations such as this, it can slow one's reaction time down to a crawl. So, by the time the gears in my head had finished click, 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 ticking into place, 
and I had come to a realization about what it was I had just witnessed and what I should do about it. The young man and I had already just walked past each other, just crossed paths. So in this moment, I had decided. Eventually, after all of my neurons had finished firing, I had decided that what I had witnessed, clearly, was a hate crime. And I had reasoned that if one does not oppose a hate crime, one becomes part of it. One cannot simply stand by and watch. I had to do something. I had to try to fix this situation, or at least in some way make it better. Now, full disclosure here, as I turned on my heel to say something to this young man, I had no idea what it was I was going to say. I mean, what the fuck could I say? Was I going to say, don't go back to Japan? I mean, Christ, this guy probably wasn't even Jap Japanese. Was I going to say, oh, I just wanted you to know that not all Australians are like that? He was probably born and raised here, and he knows the score. But maybe, I don't know, maybe if I just said something like, I saw what happened to you, and I'm really sorry, and I hope that you have a better night here on out, and I'm just wishing you well, okay? And then I continue on my way, and he continues on his way, and... Maybe, maybe I feel good about myself. As well as I could in the circumstances. I mean, that would have been better than saying nothing, right? But it's not what happened. I think we all know that's not what happened. For you see, as I turned on my heel, the sole of my shoe upon the pavement made a sort of a creaking crunch noise. And he turned around, looking over his shoulder, and he cerned, saw me swiftly turning on my heel and beginning to walk towards him. And quick as a flash, before I could say word one, he had crossed the road, he had jumped across the wooden barricade, and he had made the heroic two to three meter drop down to the main road below, where he was able to continue down the main road away from me. Oh God, what had I just done? Now, I wish, I wish magpies, how I wish friends that I could tell you that this is the end of the story, but it is not. Let me explain something about me. You see, I believe that logic and reason in a purely linear sense is how a child views the world. It is a necessary foundation upon which we must build all knowledge, don't get me wrong. It is the, uh, it is the fertile ground from which all good things grow, but we are not, chi we are not children. And there is a point in our lives that we have to grow up and we have to adapt our reasoning to certain situations. Logic and reason will not get us through every situation. There are times we need to be emotional. There are times we need to be irrational. But in this moment, Soaring like Icarus, with my wings beginning to burn up in the sun. Processing what I had just done, how much worse I had just made this situation, I think it's fair to say that I wasn't thinking entirely clearly. And I can relate my reasoning in that, in that moment to that of a child. So... Purely logically structuring my thoughts, this was my reasoning. Although the outcome I had achieved was empirically bad, the reasoning that had brought me there, the prepositions, were true. 
that if one opposed does not oppose a hate crime, one, in some tacit way, allows the hate crime. That it was right for me to try to do the right thing. That this was a terrible situation that needed redressing. All of these prepositions were true. Therefore, as the prepositions had become increasingly true, that this situation was now so much worse, and I was now so much more involved in it. Therefore, it must logically follow that the conclusion must also be increasingly true, that I had to fix this. So this is where the story gets really difficult. You see, I knew this area really well. I knew every side street. I knew every nook and cranny of this suburb. I knew that if I went up the hill and I crossed the street and I went through the park and I went down the stairs, I could come out on the side street and that side street would intersect with the main road and that main road would allow me to come out in front of this gentleman and then I could say something to him to make it better. I could fix this. I could see the lines. There was a path to victory here. So <laughs> before I had time to adopt a more holistic way of thinking, I followed my logic and I went up the hill and I crossed the street and I went through the park and I went down the stairs and I came out on the side street. And here, here I encountered two things that I had not counted for, that I had not factored into my reasoning. The first, was that on this particular fateful night all of the street lights on the side street were out giving it a certain darkened ambiance the second thing i had not factored for is that said gentleman was walking faster than i anticipated so by the time he came into view on the main street. I was still on the side street and he looks over and he sees me there, unmistakably me silhouetted in the darkness against the night sky, standing there with my skateboard and my long hair. And before I could say word one to him, he took off in a sprint down the road and disappeared out of my life forever. And as I stood there, I had an almost out-of-body experience as the waves of self-loathing came crashing down upon me. I tell you, I, in that moment, I felt like I saw my entire life stretching out before me. All of the circumstances that had led me to this moment, and it was all, it was all chaos. None of it meant anything. And as I hung my head down there, the shadow that passed over my soul, darkness filled me up and I realized that though life is long, though life has many twists and turns, in this moment, in this exact second, I may have reached an exceptionalism that I would never see again, no matter how many years I lived. For in that moment, in that solitary second, for a flash, I was the worst person on the whole planet, so it seemed to me. And that, and that, that moment, that memory, that feeling, I knew it would live with me for the rest of my life. And it was about 10 years before I told anybody about this story. I thought it would die with me. But do you want to know, do you want to know, friends, what is the worst part of all? is that at the end of the day, there is still a very real part of me that still wants more than anything else 
to find that path to victory, to figure out what roads I need to go down to find where this man is today and try to make it better. I mean, could you imagine? He's like, probably, I don't know, maybe he went back to Japan or something. God knows. Like, he's probably just, literally just gone, or gotten over the trauma. And then suddenly I'm there, like, in his face, like, come back! I need you to acknowledge my guilt! Christ. Oh, I'm sweating just talking about this. So, okay, okay. Let's try to wrap this up with a moment of hope. If there is one. And this is the bit, as well, that I've struggled with this story. As to how I'm going to tell it. What does it all mean? What is the point? What is the, what is the moral of the story? And what's the good thing I can draw from it? I don't know. <laughs> Maybe... Maybe the moral of the story is that sometimes things just get so messed up, shit gets so fucked that you just gotta walk away. Or maybe, maybe the lesson is that when we engage in these kind of performative liberal acts that are more about assuaging our own guilt than it is in addressing the underlying causes, sometimes that can be worse than the original bigotry that we're trying to oppose. Well, maybe it's as simple as we just shouldn't engage in our social justice practice when we're high. I think that's probably a good lesson. But maybe, I don't know. Maybe the lesson is that at the end of the day, nothing, that no one is in charge. That everything we do is just chaos. And we're not in control of everything. We just think we are. But I don't think it has to be so doomerist. Because if you'll allow me to wax philosophical for a moment, my understanding, at least my very limited understanding of Sigmund Freud's analysis of dreams, is that Dreams are when our mind is trying to process information that we cannot handle. We're trying to work through trauma, we're trying to work through our hopes and our dreams and our beliefs, and we're trying to work out who we are, and yet the dream hides it from our conscious mind in such a way that we are only able to perceive the dream after we awake. And upon waking, we take the chaos of our subconscious mind, the discordant images of everything happening at once, and we order it into a narrative that makes sense to us, that makes us feel better. And it's not to say that there is no meaning to it, because in those narratives, we hide clues as to who we really are. We hide clues as to what we really think and what we're really trying to grapple with. The like a like a like a map, a treasure map to our inner pain, and our hopes, and our dreams, and our aspirations. And I think that this is a potent metaphor for all of life and all of reality and everything we do within it, because the end of the day, life is chaos. Stuff happens. The present is a dream. By the time we are aware of it, it has already passed, and it is only after the fact that we organize the events of the past into a narrative that lets us live with ourselves. This is the nature of all knowledge. This is the nature of identity. This is the nature of history and philosophy. And it's okay. Because while a post-enlightenment rationalist frame often has us believe that narrativization is the enemy of truth, at the end of the day, if we feel better about ourselves, that that is a kind of truth. And 
if it helps us. At this early stage to move towards a place of acceptance, then that is a truth as well. And I think that there is room here. I talk a lot about like holistic ways of thinking. And I think that in this case, we can have our cake and eat it too. This is my hope. This is my, this is my message of hope. Por que no los dos? Why can't we have both? I believe that there is room for us to unshirkingly face the difficult truth of our past and at the same time create room to tell the best narratives we can, to serve the objective we want. And I believe we can pay respect to the truth and to ourselves and to our feelings. I think that facts do care about our feelings because at the moment we accept them as facts, we have built them into our waking dream. We have already retroactively ordered them. Which is not to say that there is no empirical truth. Certainly not. I mean, in a way there isn't, but I hope you know what I mean. We walk a delicate balance. And this, I think, the ability to change the past while letting it remain the same. I think that this, this is the power of stories. And I hope if you will tolerate me, we will tell many more stories together. Thank you. I hope the story wasn't too cringe. And you all have a great night. Take care of yourselves. Stand up against things you see happen that are wrong, but not in a way. You know, do good things. Just uh, don't necessarily do what I did. And take care of one another. Thank you.